On this edition of Native Report, we view legendary works of fine art at the Gilcrease Museum in Oklahoma. And some of the stories I want to tell are completely... We interview noted filmmaker Chris Eyre. Housing issues. And, and we meet Eastern Band of Cherokee know, Indians Vice Chief Larry Bly. About how do we create those opportunities? We also learn something new about Indian country and hear from our elders on this Native Report. Production of Native Report is made possible by grants from the Shakopee Mittawakanton Sioux Community and the Blandin Foundation. Welcome to Native Report, I'm Stacy Thunder. Just 10 minutes from downtown Tulsa, Oklahoma, the Gilcrease Museum holds an unrivaled collection of Native American art and artifacts. Founded by Thomas Gilcrease of the Muscogee Creek Nation, the museum has a collection of over 400,000 pieces. Sacred Rain Arrow by master sculptor Alan Hauser is prominently displayed at the entrance to the Gilcrease Museum in Tulsa, Oklahoma. It is but one of thousands of pieces of art from the museum's permanent collection celebrating Native American culture. Thomas Gilcrease founded the museum. Thomas Gilcrease was the oldest of 14 children. He was born in 1890 in Louisiana and shortly after that his family moved to the Indian Territory to take advantage of what was anticipated to be the division of tribal lands. And in 1899, Thomas Gilcrease received a 160-acre allotment at Glenpool from the Muscogee Creek Nation, his share of the communal lands held by the Muscogee Nation. In 1905, oil was discovered underneath his property, and it made him a very wealthy over time. It gave him the financial resources to do what he wanted to do in life, and what he chose to do was collect art and artifacts. He began collecting in 1912, and was still collecting at the time of his death in 1962. And it's obvious from looking at the collection that he amassed over a period of five decades that he collected to reflect his own interest, his Native American ancestry, as well as his white ancestry. And what Thomas Gilcrease was able to do was put together one of the finest collections of Western American art and Native American art in existence. So we're very fortunate today to have this collection here in Tulsa, Oklahoma, to tell the story of the American experience. The art collection includes 10,000 paintings, drawings, prints, and sculptures by 400 artists from colonial times to the present. One of my favorites is a portrait of a Black Hawk and his son Whirling Thunder, uh, which was painted by John Wesley Jarvis in 1833. It was painted uh, shortly after the Black Hawk War, and it was painted while they were prisoners of war. Uh, Andrew Jackson, to celebrate the U.S. victory over the Sac and Fox, uh, took the, the leaders uh, of the tribe, Black Hawk and Whirling Thunder and others, to different points in the East to show uh, these war captives to the American public. The, the portrait, I think, is extremely important because it, so much can be read into the portrait in their dress, in their countenance, in their physical appearance. And Willard Stone, uh, in spite of the fact the name is Stone, he worked primarily in wood, if I'm not mistaken. That's right. He was an excellent wood sculptor. Uh, he was uh, born in 1916 in uh, Oktaha, uh, Oklahoma and uh, died in, the, in 1985 and was just a magnificent sculptor in spite of the fact that he was missing uh, his thumb and first and second fingers of his right hand, the, the, the hand that he used uh, in sculpting. And we're uh, fortunate to have the largest collection of Willard Stone material in existence uh, here at Gilcrease Museum. 
Another celebrated artist is the previously mentioned Alan Hauser, whose sculpture Earth Mother sits inside the museum. Alan Hauser was a member of the Warm Springs Band of Chiricahua Apaches, and he was the first member of the Warm Springs Band to be born in freedom in 27 years. After the surrender of Geronimo in 1886, Alan Hauser was a tremendous artist, uh, a, a, a sketch artist, a painter, a sculptor, and is best known today for his, his sculptures. He died in 1994, but left us a tremendous legacy of his artwork, uh, which uh, some of which you can see at the Gilcrease Museum today. The sculpture outside the, the building is called Sacred Rain Arrow, and it is also the image on Oklahoma license plates. And the, the sculpture uh, inside the building that you were referring to is called Earth Mother, a beautiful uh, sculpture that uh, we think very highly of. The archival collection also includes historical manuscripts, documents, and maps. All will eventually be made available online, changing the way research is done at the Gilcrease Museum. The archival collection is something that uh, most people are very surprised at. We have almost 100,000 rare books and manuscripts. We have manuscripts that document the founding of democracy in the United States, including the only certified copy of the Declaration of Independence. Here's the next one. We have uh, lots of documents and material related to the American Indian attempt to maintain their homeland during the 19th century, uh, during the removal period and later. And this is a, an extremely important body of work for uh, studying uh, the government to government relationships between American Indians and the United States government. The Gilcrease Museum is owned by the city of Tulsa and it's managed by the University of Tulsa. And this partnership, which has been in place since 2008, has been a win-win-win situation for all parties. Well, we have very close relationships uh, with uh, the tribes in eastern Oklahoma. And we have a, um, a program to invite greater involvement by those tribes, the Cherokee Nation, the Osage Nation, Muscogee Nation, uh, Sac and Fox, uh, the Chickasaw Nation and Choctaws. We're still collecting uh, art. We have more than 400 artists represented in the collection, more than 300,000 items in the uh, total collection, including 12,000 works of fine art. Uh, and most of the, and a good percentage of those are, are, were created by American Indian artists. Last year we had over 112,000 visitors you will see a lot of art that you have seen only in books and publications. And you will see artwork that you have never seen before uh, uh, from any source. And it will be art that you can relate to directly because it reflects a collective heritage of America. And it's art that will provide a window on the American experience. Did you know that Gilcrease Museum is located in Tulsa, Oklahoma? It houses the world's largest collection of art of the American West. Thomas Gilcrease was a member of the Creek Nation in Oklahoma, and his tribal membership entitled him to an allotment of 160 acres located south of Tulsa. The land became part of one of Oklahoma's major oil fields, and Gilcrease proved to be an able businessman. He traveled extensively in Europe during the 1920s and 1930s. His visits to European museums inspired him to create his own collection. Pride in his American Indian heritage and interest in the history of the American West provided a focus for his collecting. Thomas Gilcrease believed that the story of the American West could be told through art and that the history of American Indians could be preserved through painting, sculpture, and other forms of art. He was a patron to a number of Native American artists of his time, and he purchased over 500 paintings by 20th century Native American artists. Today, the Gilcrease Museum has an extensive long-term Native American art exhibition.
Filmmaker Chris Eyre is best known for his film Smoke Signals, and he's described as the preeminent filmmaker of our time. Coming up next, Tad Johnson sits down with Chris to talk about his influences, the art of the moving image, and future projects. Everybody gets their start somewhere, and for filmmaker Chris Eyre, it was the gift of a camera. I like all sorts of art. I love books, and I love fine art, and photography especially. And I got started in filmmaking through photography. I grew up in a small town in southern Oregon, and I was in the Cascade Range of Crater Lake and Klamath Lake, and I just started taking pictures. Um, I had a, a, a teacher give me a camera when I was in high school, and I remember the camera it was an Olympus OM2N, and I started taking pictures obsessively, and I never looked back. And I'll be forever indebted to her for helping me, which teachers do. I'm part of academia now, and teachers, you know, have the ability to really have an impact on young people and she certainly had an impact on me and I never looked back after I started taking pictures. Chris is in Duluth to screen his film Skins. He has also directed three episodes of the PBS five-part miniseries We Shall Remain. I'm gonna screen the movie Skins tonight which I can't look at but I'll sit and absorb the movie. I haven't seen it in a few years. But I mean, certainly that was me at that time. And what that was was uh, a very righteous, uh, opinionated point of view and filmmaker at the time. When I um, was approached uh, by WGBH Boston to look at these scripts for We Shall Remain, um, the miniseries about Native history, I said to myself immediately, I don't think I want to do Native history. And the reason for that was because in all the scripts that I'd received after Smoke Signals about Native Americans, the end was always the same. The end was the Indians die. And it's romanticized. And that's really Hollywood's take on Native subject matter. But when I looked at the scripts and talked to everybody over there, I realized that this was much more complicated. And when you talk about the Trail of Tears in particular, uh, Wes Studi, who played Major Ridge, had always been told of his own Cherokee tribe that Major Ridge was the villain. And as we discussed it more and more, we realized that Major Ridge had done something that most people didn't recognize, and that was that he saved a lot of people by his will uh, to move himself and his family and his followers. The award-winning and highly acclaimed Smoke Signals is Chris's breakthrough feature film. The final powerful scene was originally scripted differently. Tell me what happened, Thomas. Tell me what's going to happen. The end of the movie Smoke Signals was written opposite of the way that we ended up cutting it. And that was to say that the end of the script didn't have the Dick Lorry poem. It didn't have the helicopter shots. It basically followed uh, a raging river backwards up into a creek. And the two boys at 10 years old, Victor and Thomas, were standing there. And Victor's dad, played by Gary Farmer, comes out of the water like the salmon rising and meets his son on the shore. And that's how the movie was written to end. And Brian Burdan, who was the editor, and myself and the producers and Sherman, sat in the editing room for months and uh, realized that the ending didn't work. And Brian Burdan, uh, you know, to his expertise, was the one who really figured out how to reverse the material and make it uh, what it was, what it ended up being. 
Um, but then the other things that took it over the top were the Eulali song, which is the music, and um, the Dick Lorry poem, which was, you know, one of a kind, and it was an epilogue to, you know, this movie in which um, it's about forgiving your fathers. And without those elements of Brian Burdan reversing the ending and Eulali's music cue and the Dick Lorry poem, uh, the movie wouldn't be the movie. You know, I used to say that I'm a, a filmmaker that happens to be Native American, but that's really also a disservice to the specificity of some of the stories that I want to tell. And some of the stories I want to tell are completely, you know, draped and, and endeavored and cloaked in Native American, Indian country, to a degree that I know that I'd like other people to see. There's no one voice to Indian country. Uh, there's a community. And there are so many wonderful stories that are being made around the world um, by indigenous people that they're starting to articulate what native cinema is. If we forgive our fathers, what is left? I've been uh, a carver my whole life. It's just something that's inside of me. The Creator uh, gives everyone a gift, and my gift must be sculpting. And if you neglect a gift that the Creator gives you, it's going to be hard to uh, lead a, a happy and healthy life. So everybody was given a gift. They have a, a special thing that they can do and it's up to you to pursue it and uh, to bring beauty and nature to everyone. I heard uh, on Native American Calling the other day one man saying that we live in heaven. Why, why would we even have to worry about the next life when we live in heaven right now? Have all of the clean, fresh air, fresh water, the food that grows on the water. We're in heaven. Next, Larry Blythe, Vice Chief of the Eastern Band of Cherokee, is a lifelong resident of Western North Carolina. I sat down with a vice chief to learn about the Kuala Boundary, his years of public service, and creating opportunity for the Eastern Band members and across the region. At the foot of the Great Smoky Mountains is where Eastern Band of Cherokee Nation Vice Chief Larry Blythe and Native Report host Stacy Thunder find a cool spot to talk about the history of the Kuala Boundary and other issues important to the nation. We're in the Snowbird community. Snowbird community is about 45 miles from the main town of Cherokee. Historically, this was one of the areas that uh, uh, during the removal period was uh, one of the first groups that were removed on, on the Trail of Tears for us. We have about 56,000 acres of land total. Here in Snowbird, probably around 2,000 acres. Cherokee County, about 3,000. And then the body of the property is in Cherokee, what we call the Kuala Boundary. We had a gentleman named Will Thomas who um, accumulated property, accumulated deeds to property, and allowed our tribal people to live on his property. And so the, the bulk of the land we have today comes from those deeds that Will Thomas held and allowed our people to live on until the uh, United States government took those deeds in trust for the tribe. 
Over the past several years, Vice Chief Blythe said the council has worked on community development in a variety of ways. To us, community is uh, youth trying to provide those opportunities for them that uh, uh, are needed, whether it's recreational, whether it's opportunities for summer employment, whether it's, uh, you know, just, just a variety of things that the tribe has initiated. I know here in the Snowbird community, we have a, uh, a unique opportunity with the United States Forest Service. You know, as you've driven through our country, it's very mountainous and, and not a lot of buildable, uh, suitable land for, for any large development. But we teamed up with the U.S. Forest Service in a uh, land lease. And so with that, we're creating a new youth uh, center and a portion of that, of course, is the Boys and Girls Club that's here in Snowbird. It's under construction now. It should be opening by late uh, next year. Maybe Thanksgiving, definitely by Christmas. So that is a, a, something that the council and the leadership uh, looked at uh, as a definite need for this area, this, this community. We look at those opportunities that we believe will provide safe recreational opportunities, a safe environment, a good learning environment. Um, so we, we pride ourselves in that. You know, from the senior uh, standpoint of community, of course, they're the backbone of, of who we are as Cherokee people. We, uh, we listen to our elders. We look at what they tell us as tribal leadership is important. We have looked at uh, opportunities for them from, you know, the housing needs to their recreational needs. In the Cherokee area proper, uh, we have invested uh, in greenways. We've invested in the downtown uh, revitalization areas of, of uh, water features. We've developed uh, the Island Park, which is just outside the uh, the council house area. Uh, and so those, those things that other communities have, we've been able to develop. And that, of course, brings in another, the sense of the community, that you want a nice area to recreate, have a picnic with your family and those type things. Uh, and they're very well received in the community and they're very well used. Being a good neighbor to the surrounding counties is important for the council. You know, the chief and I have been in office 10 years. You know, we don't run as a team, but we serve together. And one of the first things we did when we got elected 10 years ago, we're currently in our third third term, um, was to reach out to the counties and, and meet with the county commissioners, uh, meet with the sheriffs, because our people and our land base does not support all the tribal membership to be able to live on, on trust property. So we have people in those communities that we want to make sure that they're receiving services, but they're receiving them in a very good, um, in a very good way. Historically, that's probably not always been the case, but we made the effort to reach out to each, each commission, each county uh, uh, leadership to see what the issues were and how we could be good neighbors, good partners with them. The rise of gaming has been beneficial to the Eastern Band and surrounding communities, but there are still goals and hopes the Vice Chairman has for the nation. Back in the early 90s, the tribe had created a, uh, a bingo hall, and as many tribes had, I think that was our first foray into, into gaming. I think initially started with maybe 300 employees, three to 500. Today we have almost 2,700, and that's of course in the hotel side and the, and the casino side, all the hospitality uh, things that are necessary. And within the past year, the Tribal Council now has approved um, a second casino site in Cherokee County. I think diversity of our economy is something we're always conscious of. We're very blessed to be here. We have a, a huge spiritual um, connection, if you will. Our tribe to what's been granted to us through, through God. 
to be able to live, work, enjoy the beauty that, that we have today. So it's not a bad thing to be able to live and work and do what you really like to do on a daily basis in, in this environment. For more information about Native Report or the stories we've covered, look for us at nativereport.org and Facebook. Thank you for spending time with us here on Native Report. I'm Stacy Thunder. We'll see you next time. Stacy Thunder is a member of and legal counsel for the Red Lake Nation, and Tad Johnson is a member of the Boys Fort Band of Chippewa and is chair for the American Indian Studies Department on the campus of the University of Minnesota Duluth. Production of Native Report is made possible by grants from the Shakopee Mittawakanton Sioux Community and the Blandin Foundation. <laughs>